Great. Well, um, I don't want to take up too much, um, well, any more of our time than we already have, um, since we have a great presentation today. But welcome, everybody, um, to our last um, Brown Bad lecture of the summer. I can hardly believe it. I'm sure you're all somewhat sad and relieved that the program's coming to an end, as I know it's, it's a lot of hard work, um, even though it's wonderful. Um, so we'll go ahead, and as we have done in the past, we will have um, Patrick Cheney, who's with us, he will be um, introducing our speaker um, and her topic in Nahuatl, and then I will follow that with the English translation. Um, then we will turn the time over to Alana, and following her presentation, we will have time for a Q&A, so um, please put any questions that you have um, throughout the presentation in the chat. Um, you can also just say that you have a question if you would like me to call on you and you want to personally ask that yourself. So without further ado, um, go ahead, uh, Ricky, take it away. Ena Tlaskamati. Tlaskamati Pampa Timo Sansecotelia Seoktonati Ipani Tla Panestilisli. The Center for Latin American Studies class, Ipan We Katlamastiloyan Tlenyuta, Kie Kana Ni Tla Panestilisli Tlenkichiwa Shishiwi, Ni Sanelisli Eli. Tlen tlamastilisli tlen nawa tlen mochiwa shishiwi waya tlamastiani tlen idies a se. Towantin tikneki titla palewise ika tla teh temolisli ika masewal tlalamikayo yeka klas ki yekana ni tla panestilisli waya seki in tla panestil tla panestiani ken se tlamastiani tlen nawa tlamastiani tlen weka tlamastiloyan tlen yuta. Tlamastiani tlen seyo katlamastiloyan, momastiani tlen nawa tlen naman wan tlen panotokeja. Nama tlawa tiol paktoke, pampa, tik selia se momastike tlen cursos de verano, ya itoka alana ese rado sur, ya se historiadora del arte tlen masa igual isco pincayo tlen América. Ya momastiki cine. Ya no hia se tla tech temoke tlen instituto de investigación pan getty, wan se candidata a doctora tlen historia del arte pan Ohio State katla mastiloyan. Y wei tla tetemolis ki ye cana kenihi nesiaya se tla mantli tlen ashkana moita tlen kwa tla la mikelisli tlen wan tlen san monel toka. Pan we Shiwi kawi post clásico wan ipewaya kawi colonial ipameshko. Seyok teki tlen kichitok elki i tesis tlen i maestria ipan katlamastiloyan tlen Chicago. Kampa ki teh temoji i teki tlen wakeros diplomáticos. Tekitini tlen museos wan tlakowani tlen tlamantli precolombiano ipan gran nicoya. I teki ika iniciativa tlen Corice Florentino, pan GRI, wan Cacha, Huiaicuna, pan Andes, wan Ica, Masewal Iscopincayo, tlen Altepeme, pan Amazonia Tlali, y pan Ohio, we Cazamastiloya, ki Nestia, y Tlapaliwilis, y Catlatol Chamancayo, wan Kiwalita, ma Motlapoca, miactequi, campa Motetilice, Masewal Altepeme. Nitonati alana ki panestis se kensin ika itla tetemolis tlen motokastia codex savil ika tira tlen don Martin. Ki ita tlapowalis li tlen nawa iskopinkayo. Mo iquilotok ika sekin tlaquiloviani uh, ni ama ki panestia se kawi tlen mil cuatrociento y dos hasta mil quinientu cuarenta y cinco. Campa kinestia ki salisli, kima yolki al tepe, wan quali tlayekanani. Hasta kima asike, coyome y pan kawayome, kima wetski tenochtitlan y pan mil quinientu veintiuno, wan kima peji cristiano teopa. Y canopa ama peji onca tlatetemolisli y pa mil novecientu veinte, kima kalaji pan museo tlen American Indian Hair Foundation. Moishmati nama ika codex savil, pampa ijino y toca eliaya tlenki pantiji. Ipani ipowal conquista se yanqui tlatetemolisli 
pewa mochiwa y caset la mantli etno histórico, wani la tehtemolisli, wala y ca yanquik y talisli, y ca nawa y scopincayo, wanawa tlaquiloli. Y ca nawa tlaquilolisli, wan inglés tlaquilolisli, ni ama que cuatlalía, cuando hiá que copina, tlatoli, tlen se tlaca, tlen motoca y smati martín, campe quito, tlen y asca para ite y smacawan. No que pewa el se cawi colonial y ca europeos, ni ama tlen don martín, que en el panestía, que niji mosenquilía, nawa nemilisli, pan mesco al tepetzitzi. Tica quise achtoi alana y tlapanestilis, Wanteipa tipiase maklakli pilkawitzitzin, kampa tichiwase toantin tlatlanelisli. Wan nama sanilos kari achi ka ingles. Wan wei tlaskamati. Wei tlaskamati, Ricky. Thank you so much, Ricky. That was wonderful. Um, so we'll now have the English translation of that. So thank you all for joining us once more um, for our brown bag lecture series. Um, the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Utah holds annual Brown Bad Lecture Series as part of the Summer Nahuatl Language and Culture Intensive Program in partnership with EDIAS. In an effort to create a network of Indigenous Studies scholars, CLASS organizes these talks with a variety of speakers ranging from the program's Nahuatl program instructors, U of U faculty, external academics, as well as current and past students. So you were just able to hear uh, Ricky, one of the past students of the program, and Alana also was, uh, attended our program. Um, so we will first listen to the presentation, and then we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. So Alana Ralozur is one of um, is an art histor historian of indigenous arts in the Americas. With a background as a filmmaker and a lens-based artist, she is a research specialist at the Getty Research Institute and a doctoral candidate in the history of art at Ohio State University. Her dissertation research considers the graphic depiction of invisible concepts from the sensorium to the divine in post-classic and early colonial Nahua artistic traditions from central Mexico. A second project developed from her master's thesis at the University of Chicago explores the fluid roles of diplomats, um, Loqueros museum staff and art dealers in the history of collecting pre-Columbian objects of, uh, Gran, of Gran Nicoya. Uh, her work with the Florentine Codex Initiative at um, GRI, the Getty Research Institute, um, and the Andean and Amazonian Indigenous Art and Humanities Community at OSU uh, demonstrate her advocacy for language revitalization and the creation of open access projects that open um, archives to empower Indigenous communities. So today, Alana will share some of her research entitled From the Codex Seville um, to uh, Tira uh, of Don Martin, um, Reevaluating a Nahuatl Pictorial History. Written in phases by a series of painters, this Nawa document um, recorded a chronology from 1402 to 1545 detailing migration, um, polity foundation, and successive rulers through the arrival of Europeans on horseback, the fall of Tenochtitlan in 1521, and the foundation of local Christian church. Little studied since the 1920s when it entered the collections of the Museum of American Indian uh, Hayev Foundation, it has been known for a century as the Codex uh, Seville, after the collector who acquired it. At the conquest, uh, uh, <laughs> um, a new touchstone analysis of this document integrates diagnostic imaging, scientific and ethno-historical analysis, and provenance research um, with a renewed focus on the Nahuatl pictographic and alphabetic text. A transcription and English translation for the alphabetic text clarifies that this document also records the words of a man known as Don Martin, dictating the distribution of his wealth to his descendants. Rather than a, a rupture driven by European invasion, this tira of Don Martin instead emphasizes um, specific local continuity. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and turn the time over to Alana. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. <laughs> That's a uh, whole talk in and of itself, just uh, reading all of that text. So thank you both um, and for the warm welcome. So Piali, no tikish koyoan, 
y um, Momesh Tiani Nokia. Uh, es un placer hablar con ustedes hoy sobre este tierra de Don Martín, pero voy a presentar en inglés. <laughs> si tienen preguntas en español, o que piense Kathleen Lisley y Katnawat, voy a tratar de responder en cualquier idioma. Ok, <laughs> muy bien. Let's get started. I, um, here we're meeting in this virtual space, so rather than giving a standard landed acknowledgement like I might uh, uh, in person, instead I'd like to make a, a call to action, and particularly for those of you in the audience who are like me, uh, non-native, um, to find ways to support the Indigenous community wherever it is that your feet touch the ground. So in uh, California and Los Angeles, where my work is, Cielo is an indigenous women-led organization doing really important labor on behalf of the indigenous community and particularly in support of indigenous migrants. They provide cultural programming, including music and literature events, financial solidarity in the Indaku Indigenous Fund and the World Harvest. And they provide a center for indigenous languages with resources uh, in translation, cultural awareness training, they work with interpreters, and during the pandemic, they've provided COVID-19 out outreach materials in a variety of Indigenous languages for distribution, both in Los Angeles as well as online. So I encourage you to find uh, organizations such as Cielo uh, in your own community. And if you'd like to support Cielo in particular, I'd like to plug the, their recent book that they've just published, um, a beautiful collection of photographs um, of uh, undocumented uh, indigenous women in Los Angeles um, and uh, almost poetic excerpts from interviews um, with these women um, about their experiences uh, as migrants and as indigenous women in, in the community in Los Angeles. So without further ado, I'll move on to my own research here. The focus of today's talk is this incredibly long document. Um, it's a, a 16th century uh, document with a pictographic text, as well as an alphabetic text in Nahuatl. So we're calling it a tira, literally meaning strip. Uh, it's a, it made in uh, amat or amate paper, rather than in animal hide or on cloth as other uh, pre-Hispanic documents. And it's in an annals of format. So it's a history of the community organized by time. And that's what I'm highlighting here. Time is represented in this document as a, a column of shiwit. So these blue discs um, using the word shiwit as this polysemic term for both uh, the solar year of 365 days as well as the color and material of turquoise. So here it's a little visual pun uh, that then runs the length of the entire document as you can see. The dates uh, uh, are only listed here um, in 13 year intervals. So you have these this very clean line of, of uh, shiwit circles and uh, say aka to say say tekpat, one one read one flint, and you can determine the re the years in between those points. So that's how the time is organized. <clears throat> the study of this particular document um, that I that I'm explicating today is a collaborative project that has involved a great number of many people. So um, Mackenzie Cooley over here on the left is also a former Nawat student of the Utah Summer Program. Together, we work with this large team of conservators and material scientists at the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress um, uh, to provide this imaging that you're seeing here. Um, you can go through all, all of the names if you'd like, but uh, most importantly, in the summer of 2019, I brought uh, the images that were provided by this wonderful team at the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress to uh, the, the summer program and the older Nahuatl class led by John Sullivan. And together we began the transcription and translation of the alphabetic Nahuatl text. Um, this is the first time that has been attempted in 100 years of scholarship on this document. Um, and it, it is the result of this that allows us to stop using the collector's name to refer to this document as the Codex Sabio, but instead to rename it after one of its own protagonists, a man named Don Martin. The materials analysis conducted um, by the folks at the Smithsonian and, um, and the Library of Congress shows us that the materials used to, to create this document are typical for indigenous documents made in central Mexico in the late post classical period and into the early colonial period. Um, so I'm not gonna go into that in too much detail, but needless to say, these are pigments that are directly on the amat. So you can see the, the texture of um, this ficus tree paper 
um, here and that it's not it's not sized in any way it doesn't have any kind of layer in between the pigments are directly painted onto the paper um, and the pigments are typical the first pass would have been entirely just in black ink or clearly carbon black um, and the, all of the pigments that uh, are used in the early phase of the document are 100 percent indigenous materials they're typical characteristic of post-classic central mexico they um the, the exceptions of, are, are the Maya blue, which is imported in the post-classic period from Maya land into, uh, into central Mexico. And that's this bright toothpaste um, turquoise color that you see here. Um, and then there's also an iron gall ink that's used to um, clarify some of the texts at the, at the latest point of inscription on the document. So the alphabetic text is originally written uh, in Tlili by itself. And then at some point, um, we have we have some theories about uh, the iron gall ink is used to sort of clarify some of these letters. So here it used to say H U I Hui, and then it's been changed to H U A Hua. The life history of the document itself um, it shows us that it's created in phases by different people at different times, and we can kind of reconstruct that by looking at those materials um, and how they're inter interwoven with each other. Um, so the, the, the basic layout of, uh, of the life history, uh, the first set of inscriptions are all having to do with migration and the founding of an Altepet. Um, these, these would have been uh, originally inscribed in black ink, so in Tlili. Um, that, that continues into the later succession of rulers, as well as uh, documenting the European invasion and the establishment of a local church, Christian church that happens at the end of the document. Probably all of that was originally uh, executed in, in black ink. Um, and the second, uh, at, at the end of that, uh, we have an addition of color. And at the same time of the addition of color, there's a revision to the timeline. There's, there's uh, moving the years around and simultaneously linking the time in the local uh, space to the lineage, uh, the, the, the order of time within Imperial Tenochtitlan. Uh, so that happens on the outside of that uh, that row of shiri. <clears throat> then the then there's the addition of the alphabetic text that happens later, and the first pass of that again is in clearly in black ink, uh, and then the reinscription that happens later, probably in the course of a land dispute or in a court situation uh, where where this document is being used as evidence, and so uh, a scribe is reinscribing, trying to clarify the letters to help them read it. Um, and then the last phases of this document's life history uh, are the repairs that happened before it was it entered into the collections in this sort of nebulous period where we don't know what, where it was and where it was being kept, where it traveled. Um, and then the final stage are the conservation treatments that have happened to the to the document since it entered the collection of the museum. And so that's it, sort of giving a framework of how we structured this study to think of. Uh, to, to think of the, the document's history from the point of view of the document itself. <laughs> so this first phase here, the first event that's recorded, starts at the bottom of the document and works its way up to the top. So at the bottom of the document, we have this beautiful line of footprints that um, emerge uh, and come up um, to uh, uh, the first Tlatawani of the community. Um, so he's seated here. Um, probably with a, a glyph showing the, the toponym for the Altepet that's being founded. Um, and the Tlatumani is also uh, named up here in the corner. I'm not gonna go into all of the uh, um, details of each individual thing, um, but just to give you a sense of the sort of structure of the document. So the first movement is migration to the seating of the first ruler and uh, the establishment of the Altepet. Then as we move up the document, um, you can see I've circled each of the uh, different Tlatawani here. We have the lineage of rulership um, going through uh, time. Uh, it, and each, each of these uh, rulers is depicted in basically the same way, but you can see stylistically they're a little bit different. Um, the first one is at much larger scale than the others. And his um, uh, Teposik Pali that he sits upon this throne uh, with the high back is as shown with an open side. It's a slightly different rendering than the successors. Um, each of them are named, and we've made some attempts at um, parsing their names, um, but without being able to corroborate the, that information against another document. 
um, it's still an open question. So that's a point for further study. Um, but you can see here that the, the, the reigns are, are varying lengths. We have one fellow here with an incredibly long reign of 46 years. And so we'll look at him in a little bit more detail. Uh, he is at the end of the, he's the fourth Tlatomani of the five. Um, and he's uh, marked by this uh, really interesting absence of information. There's no further events that are recorded during his reign. Uh, for 35 of the 46 years, nothing is recorded. And so I'm thinking of Michel Rolf Trillot here in, in that there's a silence in this document that, that, that lasts through the majority of this man's reign. However, there's this very important event that happens at the very end of his reign, and that's the, the recorded in this um, intense battle between uh, a conquistador, a Spaniard, and uh, a, a sort of generic Nawa warrior. And both of them actually are not really individuals. They both serve this sort of generic soldier representing the two, these two sides. Um, it's a really interesting image for a number of reasons. So let's take a look at it in a little more detail. So looking at this, this um, conquistador uh, probably was originally painted entirely in, in black and then the color is added later, probably at a much, uh, much later point. But the addition of color really emphasizes the amount of metal that is a part of this um, conquistador's outfit, right? All of the armor that he's wearing, he's got a chainmail shirt. Um, there's the, 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 the shoes on the horse's hooves are, are colored in with this, uh, the, the, the turquoise the pigment. Um, really emphasizing its shininess and its, and its preciousness, its unusualness. The sword is, is almost the size of his whole body, right? Uh, and this calls to mind Kevin Teresiano's um, uh, reflection on the, this character that also appears in the description of the, the um, battle for Tenochtitlan Tlatelolco in book 12 of the Florentine Codex. Uh, where the, this, he calls him an iron man. This is a, this is a soldier who has his whole humanity is subsumed into the violence that he can inflict, right? So he's, he's in completely encased in metal. And another really interesting point to bring up here about the way the conquistador is, is depicted um, is that he's riding a horse, but of course the horse is actually depicted as, uh, as a deer. And this is reflecting that early colonial um, uh, use of the word maza to refer to horses as caballo hadn't yet been uh, incorporated into Nawa as a word. So turning to the, the, the Nawa warrior, again, we have a sort of generic uh, warrior in that he is um, wearing sort of entry level uh, armor. He's got this Ishkawipili, the quilted cotton armor and this simple war club, just wood, doesn't even have obsidian entered into it. And then he holds this Kwesio Chumali. This is an entry level insignia. And we have it in many other sources. It's one of many, um, uh, many shield designs that uh, I have this, this name, um, but it's given to warriors who are just at the beginning of their career. Um, what's really fascinating to me about the way that this, the, the, the Tlaquilo here chose to represent this though, uh, it is making use of a similar um, euphemism that is also uh, in the Florentine Codex. And, um, it's a little bit clearer in the Florentine Codex image, but what, the, what we have here, instead of the solid triangular space of color here, this, this field of black in a triangular shape, um, he's, the Tlaquilas opened it up in order to make the sort of upside down B shape, which is, uh, can be read as the, as the Greek letter uh, lambda or L for Laconia. Uh, this is the shield of the Spartans. And um, in European literature, which of course is now being distributed starting to be distributed in, in New Spain at the time that, that this image would have been painted. Uh, it, it's, it stands as an example of a valiant local force defending their homeland against overwhelming odds uh, in a, in a, against an invading force. So it's, it's the same kind of metaphor that's being used in the images in, in book 12 appears again here. And, and you see that equivalence being made between the two, this Iron Man and again, this Lambda Shield. <clears throat> so moving on past this last, this point of the, of the battle here, um, 
what's really interesting to me is that it's after uh, these these images that start to incorporate these these European influences and show this clash of cultures um, that we we get the seeding of the final fifth uh, Tlatuani in the in this Altepe, and he's depicted in exactly the same um, set of accoutrements that uh, all of the uh, all of the previous um, Tlatoque are, are also wearing. So the insignia hasn't changed. He's really expre he's expressed as an indigenous leader of this of this community, showing that the that the indigenous leadership. Uh, it is is a continuation and not a, it is not ruptured by this clearly important event that has occurred. This is fully 10 years later that he's seated. Um, but the thing that uh, is also really interesting here is that he begins to oversee another set of major changes uh, in, in the significant public projects that are undertaken in the community under his rule. So, um, these events are not explicitly tied to the column of years. So they're, they're not tied across over to the timeline, but they're sort of vaguely in this, in this period after the Slatuani is seated. Um, instead, they are explicitly tied with these little dotted lines uh, to the payment that it, it is used to, to, um, to justify them. So the community has made this outlay of cash in order to purchase this big outdoor T-shaped cross it would establish the site of a, of a religious complex, uh, and then later an even larger payment for these two um, icons of a statue and a two-dimensional two image of the Virgin Mary, both of them, one with uh, the statues of the Virgin holding the, the Christ child. And then the last purchase that we can clearly identify is this large bell, the payment for which is mostly obscured here. And then we have just this little hint of a, another another set of information that is, is now lost at the top of the page. So maybe even further um, establishing events after the fact. But drawing attention again to the interesting um, combination of, of techniques here, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, in the depiction of these, these important objects that are establishing, this new, establishing the new religious order in the, in the Altebet, I want to note how the, the colorist here who's added the pigments into the images of the Virgin Mary has, has used contrasting colors in the cloak and the dress. So on the statue, it's a, it's a red dress with a blue cloak. On the painting or possibly featherwork, it's a blue dress with a red cloak. Um, Elodie Tupé has recently uh, been writing about this type of color technique in pre-Hispanic sculpture and, and other imagery of using a really highly limited palette to create this sensation of an abundance of color. And so, so it's using a, a, a technique from a, a different set of uh, religious uh, images um, a, and applying it here in order to create the sense of an abundance of color. Another thing uh, is this emphasis on the three-dimensionality of these objects. So even in the, in the variation of the thickness of the line on the cross, the three-dimensionality of the, of the perspective around the edge of the sculpture, seeing inside and outside of the bell, we have this, this sense of um, three-dimensionality. And here again, it's an instance of incorporation of new techniques, new information into an existing system using existing structures so again, as pushing back at this idea of a rupture defined by the invasion, uh, it's not a rupture uh, because of the shift in, in political and religious power structures. It's, there's a continuation of, of, of culture within these new ideas. So uh, another thing to note here is that after the battle scene, the, the Shiwi uh, discs start to sort of veer off to the left a little bit. So this shows that we have a different person in charge of organizing the, the pictographic space on the page. So probably a new Taquilo at this point. There's also the last point at which we have a date recorded in the document. After that, even though there's more than 13 years, uh, we don't have a, a, a date marked. And I think that that's because this is actually a later campaign of revisions of new information that start to happen at this point. This is probably also when the color is, is added um, because the color is attached to these revisions of the timeline. They seem to be working backwards from this point. And indeed the year, um, say Akat one read uh, is 1519. That's when Cortez would have landed at the coast in Veracruz. 
So I'm not going to go through all of the revisions because there are, there are many, <laughs> but just to give you an idea of how that works, the revisions of the timeline work backwards and they're adding in uh, the death and seeding of, of each of the uh, lineage of rulers in the imperial capital in Tenochtitlan. So we have here, instead of in the local timeline, it's just the seeding of each Tlatuani. Here we have the death of the previous ruler followed by the seeding of the successor. So we have a, a mummy bundle followed by a, a, a person with their eyes open seated um, on the throne. And then each of them are actually identified with a name glyph up above their heads as well. Um, so we can see that the name glyph, uh, uh, that they're functioning in the same way for the Tlatoanis that we can't um, corroborate um, for the local Altepet. Then there's other corrections that are being made with pasted over pieces of Amat. Um, others are made uh, with pigment. Things are pa painted out with the, with the uh, turquoise pigment and in other cases where blotting happens. And once we get back through a few of these revisions, the dates that are um, given uh, don't quite line up with other uh, period documents. So they're, but they're all pretty close. They're within two to five years. We could start to get these fluctuations um, uh, from the seeding of Ashayaka and then going backwards in time. And so they're interesting revisions to the timeline. Now, the next stage uh, in the phases of development of this document is the addition of that alphabetic text. And the alphabetic text uh, coincides with another interesting feature, and that is the, the, it, this red dotted line, which I have recreated here because it's so hard to see in the visible light images, but represents Tlacamecayot, which is a, a literally a, a, a cord attaching people together, right? So a lineage, a bloodline, and, and painted in, in the blood red uh, of Nochestli. Uh, it attaches these three, the first three Tlatuani together, and the text appears between those Tlatuani. So it doesn't appear in that big open section where there were no events recorded uh, on the, after the fourth Tlatuani. Instead, the text also is running in the opposite direction from the timeline inscribed in years. So it starts at the feet of what who, this, this Tlatumani we're calling Ostotlakat and runs down the page to the head of the uh, founding Tlatumani the, of the Altepet. So uh, the supposition here is that this later edition, it relates directly to issues of kinship and Tlacamacayot and this is why it's inscribed around these Tlatuani, that these ones are the ones that are all a part of the bloodline. One can, one can maybe make the extrapolation that the text is then also referring to people as a part of that bloodline. So here's the text that we transcribed in the summer of 2019. Um, don't don't uh, want to go through it word for word <laughs> exactly, but the idea here is that this is a statement um, that's being transcribed from a fir first person spoken um, uh, event. Uh, so here together, we are with him. So there's a group of nobles. Here, we nobles here at Amakosak are with this man, Don Martin, who then I, Don Martin, in the first person, starts to make his statement. Part of it is lost um, in, the, in this reattachment but it's still what's left remains clear that what he's doing is making a statement about inheritance, that he's leaving his worldly goods to his descendants. And so this is what I mean about it being tied to Tlacan and Kayot. So here, uh, here at Amaklosak, I, Don Martin, I'm gonna give it to them, my children and my grandchildren, who, who are then going to be listed in the following Tlashila Kali. So we have then following the statement, a list of place names. And while we can match some of these place names to similar place names that exist within a fairly um, limited geographic region, so most of them occur, occur in, in the Pueblo Chashkala Valley, uh, bordering on Veracruz, some in the Mixteca Alto, and a few at the edge of Morelos, um, they're all very dis disparate from each other, probably are secondary places that also have similar names. We, it, what we're looking for is evidence that these Tlaxilakali are, uh, you know, subordinate to a single Altepet, a central governing Altepet. Um, <clears throat> so this is another point of future, future work, future research to be done on this, to locate this document in time and space. 
this question of where the document originated from, because it's the rupture that happens be, uh, when it enters the art market and is purchased and taken out of, out of Mexico, um, has been an ongoing question. And a lot of uh, scholars have document or have um, interpreted this, this gloss that appears underneath the, the battle scene um, as, as being the place of this document, the place where this document was, uh, was originally made. Uh, but everyone reads it differently. <laughs> so we've got Teshplapalco, Tetlapalco, Telapalco. Um, uh, but we're offering a, yet a new one, <laughs> Tenampolco, or uh, the place of the big walls coming from Tenami. And then when you wait, they can go back down to the, the glyph that appears next to the founding Flatwani, we have these, these big walls that appear around the glyph. So perhaps there's a relationship there. Um, that's about as far as that goes there. So let's go back to that glyph that's down there. This will be the, my, my last little piece of the argument. Um, <clears throat> so we've been referring to this sort of, you know, amongst ourselves as a tree and a pond and a courtyard place. Um, because what we have here is this sort of sketchy, almost uh, much more of a European style rendering of a tree than, than the kind of um, three part, um, uh, glyph of, of treeness that you get uh, in, in pre-Hispanic documents. Um, but we do have this central Mexican um, glyph for water that it's growing out of. So this is our tree in a pond <laughs> in a courtyard, yes. And then we have this sort of amorphous humanoid figure, um, just very, very vague standing there next to it. So it, the first pass of this was to do comparisons to in other documents where we had something graphically similar. Um, and probably our best bet here on that, uh, to that regard, is uh, the place sign for Alpecha Yocan in Hidalgo. Um, <clears throat> this is coming uh, from, uh, etymologically, from uh, the, the word for willow, awechot, awechote, um, and these were, are most familiar to us perhaps as the trees that line the chinampas. Um, indeed, in the Florentine Codex, the same tree is depicted in, a, in with, uh, at the base of water. Um, and so you get this one-to-one. -one. It's a tree that grows next to the water, um, and it's it's pretty good as far as you get, as far as the circular water um, glyph with the tree coming out of it. But again, because we have this sort of sketchy tree um, left un un uh, sheared, the willows will make this much rounder shape as it's depicted in the Florentine. Um, but cultivated uh, chinampa willows are are sheared to to create that uplift. Um, so, it's, so it has a bit of a different look. Likewise, a few pages later in the Codex Mendoza, we have another glyph that is a similar kind of thing, where here we still have this kind of tree, tree in this shape is being depicted. But um, here, this again is Ashokopan in Hidalgo, is just down the road <laughs> from the previous location. Um, but as the Florentine Codex points out, uh, etymologically, this is coming from a, a plant that's much more of a shrub. Um, so it's, it's, we, got the, we got the leaf shape better here. The description of the Florentine emphasizes it's, it's flavor like fruit and that it has fruit. So uh, here's those fruits. So then that makes the previous identification less, less of a good choice maybe. Uh, indeed, the uh, Ashokopan also appears on the Piedra uh, de Tizoc uh, as one of the places um, conquered. Uh, and it, it, you can see how the glyph here is even closer to the previous one. This has similarities to the one in the, in the Codex Mendoza. Um, but as David Wright Carr has pointed out, uh, the glyph that's usually identified as Asha Copan on, on the Tizak stone may indeed actually be referring to Al Huesha Yokan. And you can see by how close together they are in a list of conquered places, um, they might be uh, agglomerated together with such similar glyphs. But so, Making a graphic comparison based on treeness um, could be a bush, could be a tree, so it makes it harder to pull out a, a specific phoneme for that. We have all these different pieces of evidence for what the location is, and if we could just correlate them together, it, it feels like it's we're, it's tantalizingly close. But I think maybe the best um, argument that we have for where to do further research about the location of this document comes from the text itself. Um, that, that states, we are here in Nikan Ama, Amakusak. We are here in, in this place. So there indeed is an Amakusak in present-day Morelos. 
that that then brings us some uh, really intriguing um, connections. And uh, the glyph that's listed in the context of Mendoza and is used by the town today um, it doesn't seem to have much relation visually to to treeness, <laughs> but indeed we still have the water here emphasizing that ah sound. Um, but instead, what this is depicting uh, is a yellow piece of uh, amat. Um, so, and referring to the amacostic tree from which uh, amat is is made. And indeed, uh, here I've pulled this image just off a. a, a ecotourism website, <laughs> encouraging people to go hiking around Amakusak, um, but you can see that the, these trees indeed uh, grow with, uh, in plentitude around this area. Um, and indeed the, the province that this um, page of the Codex Mendoza is describing, or the Imperial Province of Kwaunawak, is specialized in paper production to the, to the extent that it paid tribute in the form of 8,000 bundles of paper, either twice a year or every 80 days, depending on depending on the different sources. Um, and Kwanoak was also one of the 20 provinces that produced that Kweshtekat warrior costume with that, that um, generic Kweshiochumali shield that the indigenous warriors holding in the battle. Um, this is another little clue. In case, in any case, this is this is the this is the location that I think um, will be next on my on the list of places to visit in looking for the the, the site of this document. Needless to say, there's, there is more work to do on this document to identify the specific Altepet to correlate the names of each Tlatuani. Um, but the, uh, the extent of our collaborative interdisciplinary study is just today available um, via the, the Latin American and Latinx Visual Culture Journal published by the University of California Press. And there's much, much more detail uh, than I can provide possibly today um, contained in the article. So I, I encourage you to go um, take a look for that or email me if you need a copy. Um, <clears throat> and just to wrap up, uh, this study is, is aiming to show how uh, Nahua communities maintain and survive these su successive imperial regimes, the, the Spanish Empire, the Catholic Church, the um, uh, American imperialism and collecting, uh, and these processes that continue today. And so by focusing on the Nahuatl language and the structures of indigenous time and history making, we are attempting as a group of non-native scholars to see this document from its own internal perspective across a long and convoluted cultural biography. Our hope though, is that this chair will find new indigenous audiences. So uh, while academics create ever more elaborate toolkits by which to draw meaning from Mesoamerican texts and artifacts, indigenous scholars like Luis Reyes Garcia have resisted the segregation between collection and interpretation of documents. Indeed, local histories such as these should be available to and interpreted by Nahuatl speakers across present day North America. The Tira is designed to be read by locals for whom it had personal meaning, negotiating a heritage that was and is still deeply linked to place. So may a new generation of readers find this tree in a courtyard place. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alana, for that great presentation. Um, we have just a few minutes before um, classes will start up again. Um, we do have a question um, from Kim Richter. It says, uh, since you are working uh, on, the, um, on the hands of the painters of the Florentine Codex, have you thought about hands uh, in this tier? Yes, indeed, it's a it's a similar process, um, and this is that that is the same process of how to negotiate. What are these different phases that occurred? Um, it's a little bit ambiguous, uh, and I, it's another one of these situations where I wonder to what extent some one Tlaquilo is coming in later and making changes to the earlier Tlaquilo's work. Um, but there are definitely different phases so that you can see. The first uh, Tlatoani is distinct from the ones that follow. Um, there's a there's a different style that occurs at the very end of the document. Certainly, the the uh, platoke of Tenochtitlan, completely different style of of depiction. So, the, and the handwriting is different in in Iron Gall than it is in in Tlili. Uh, so, each of those represent different different hands. That is another project I'm working on right now, um, and with another large collaboration <laughs> to identify the hands. Uh, we started with just book 12 of the Florentine Codex, uh, but 
is an ongoing an ongoing research project. Wait, can I can you explain just a little more? I'm just not sure if I followed that answer correctly. So you're identifying the different hands that were involved um, over a time and space potentially. I mean, how how broad of a time period are you talking about or revisions that took place long after the fact or are we talking about similar time frame multi hand collaborations for I guess my question for all of the codexes you're working with codices you're working with. So for this particular Tira, um, it does seem like it's a fairly condensed period uh, of time it's unclear. Um, it might have been a document that is being used in 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 court a proceeding uh, much later after the fact of what's depicted pictographically on the page. Um, but it can't be that much later because of the, the, the kind of knowledge that's being used in the alphabetic text. So it's not that far from the 16th century, no matter what. It might be late in the 16th century. Um, uh, in, the, in the Florentine Codex, um, we have the issue of um, we know that it's being paint, the images are being painted within a, a certain time period. So then it's really about um, how, how is the workshop functioning in order to create these different images? Um, and how can you pull apart the different stylistic choices that uh, people are making in order to determine this is one person and that one's a different person. So in this, in the, in the case of the Tira, I'm really using the hands as a, as something to bolster this idea that, um, that it shows that there's a different person working on this than, the, than this other part. And then the next part is done by somebody else. And so you can see how it's developing over time. Does that make a little more sense? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for clarifying that. I just wasn't sure I understood well. I'm, I, that was exactly what I was curious about. Thanks a lot. Are historians asking each other questions? <laughs> uh, I have some questions. Yeah, no, no. Did you make some kind of uh, comparison with this Tira to other Tira like the Tira de Tepetipan, which also displayed the, imper the like a parallel with the local annals and local annals with that of the imperial, uh, imperial annals of Tenochtitlan, including the post-conquest? Post uh, yeah, and it, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just, yeah, I, asked, I, I addressed my question, so. Uh, yeah, so it is making some it is making some very similar um, kinds of choices. Um, and again, it's, it's another one of these situations where you have um, this is it must be a community that's on the periphery or is 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 under the the sway of of the imperial capital. And so setting the timeline in 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 that context um, gives it a concreteness. And especially even at the point at which it's entering into the legal context. Um, gives it a frame of reference that's identifiable beyond the local context, right? Uh -huh. okay. Certainly, uh, we we can identify the, some of those names uh, from the imperial timeline, even when the names in the local timeline are yeah. more difficult to identify. Right, and even I personally personally think that the written documents, like the analysis of quote learn the annals of quote learn, can be another good some kind of comparison since that. Is a kind of gathering of the various chronology from Tenochtitlan and Quotitlan and Tepoztlan. So, apart from that, Tenochtitlan itself, the minor, minor, minor counts like the like the genealogy of Te Tepoztlan can be a can be a good compa comparison as well. So it's that it's all three tasks, all three tasks, rather than just depicting everything, just picked up the royal genealogy of each community and then make a kind of parallel with the Tenochtitlan and the post-contact post -contact period. So, so we got, so not just only there's some kind of physical similarity, but also the fact that they just use their own royal genealogy rather than adding every event as much as possible. Right. Would be some kind of good topic for tracing back, how, tracing back how they, how they some kind of, some kind of, Share share some kind of the some kind of idea for their legal legal reaction reaction or some kind of some kind of making some making some kind of important important for like what what information should be treated important and what should be treated marginally. So, yeah. Okay. 
Great. And I apologize to cut off uh, these great conversations that are going on. Um, I know that you all have class to get to, though. Um, so we would like to give a huge thank you to Alana for joining us and for for sharing um, your research with us. And um, I know some of you still have questions. Feel free to reach out to me. It sounds, Alana, like you're okay with people contacting you. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so if you if you have additional questions, please feel free to give me an email and I'm happy to connect you. And thank you all for joining us again. And we will see you um, this next week on Friday for our closing event. Thank you all. Muchas gracias, Elena. Gracias.